God, you're in control in every little detail. You are close. I'll never be alone here in the unknown. The power of your presence fills my soul. And now Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you again this Sunday. We are actually, I, I'd like to say for those of you who join us in the follow campaign, thank you so much. I hope and I pray that that had helped you decide who to follow in your life. Well, today, our culture is literally overrun with fake products. Almost anything real can be faked and purchased at a cheaper price. And I know we all know that. Remember walking, I remember walking in LA, in Chinatown in LA with a friend, and there were so many Louis Vuitton purses for like $50, fake Rolex for $40. And if you don't know the fake ones from the real ones, you can easily be conned and taken. And of course, today, you can improve your body today. We know this by fake nails, fake hair, fake teeth, everything's fake, right? Fake body parts, and then you can wear fake designer clothes, of course, made out of fake leather and fake fur and all those things. And then you can talk about fake news, to your fake friends on social media with your fake identity. I, I mean, we are surrounded by a lot of things that are fake. Now, there are some areas in life where fake works just fine, just as well as the real thing. But there are one, there's some areas in our life, and there is one area where you have to have the real thing, and it is this. You have to have real faith, not fake faith or it doesn't work. Now, in the Bible, there are over 6,000 promises of God that God has made to you. You need those promises, and we need those promises to, to stay stable and strong and healthy during these crazy times that we live in. But to access those promises, you have to have real, legitimate, genuine faith. 
Now, fake faith has no power to change your life. It has no power to save you. It has no power to answer your prayer. And fake faith has no power to actually transform your life. Now, Paul advises believers in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and he says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. And then he said this, test yourself. Now, is it possible to have fake faith instead of real faith? Now, I want to say this. Paul says, hey, you got to test your, and he's talking to Christians here. He said, you need to check yourself and examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Now, I'd like to guarantee you this today. This is going to make a huge change in your life. This is going to be very helpful. Now let me read to you what James chapter 2 verse 14 all the way down to 20 says. It says there, Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? That kind of faith cannot save anyone. Suppose you see your brother or sister who needs food or clothing and you say to them, oh, I wish you well. I feel for you. I hope you stay warm and eat well. But then you don't do anything to meet their need. What good? What good does your sympathy do? It's nothing. Then he said this, in the same way, if it is not accompanied by action, in the same way, faith, if it is not accompanied by action, doesn't work. It is dead and it is useless. Now, someone may argue, well, some people can have faith while others do good deeds. But I say, I can't see your faith if I don't see any good deeds good works in you. I don't see good works to show for it. Now, in contrast, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Now you say, well, I believe there is a God. And I say, well, for, 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 well, good for you. But even the demons believe that, even the demons believe that. And they are afraid. It's foolish not to realize that faith in God is useless if you don't do what God wants you to do. Now, after reading that passage that I just read, I am sure that some people think, hey, there's a contradiction between what Paul and James is saying. Paul is the one who wrote most of the New Testament books, the, the New Testament Testament books in the Bible. Now, Paul teaches about being saved by grace through faith and not of works. And people say, well, I'm just saved. I don't need to do any kind of work anymore because I'm already saved. Now, people think Paul and James is actually contradicting each other. But James and Paul do not contradict each other. Instead, they complement each other. For instance, when Paul's writing, in Paul's writing, the emphasis of Paul is how to know I'm saved. But the emphasis, emphasis of James is how to show I am saved, right? Now, Paul focuses, when he writes about this, he's focusing on the root of my salvation, which is internal, and it's not seen. It's unseen. James is, James is focusing on the fruit of my salvation, which is external, and is supposed to be visible. Now, it's two sides of the same cone. Coin. When Paul talked about works, <clears throat> he's actually talking to his, to, to his audience about keeping Jewish laws and Jewish traditions in order to become believers, which was the prevailing belief of the people that he was talking to. He says, hey, if you think that, that doing all these traditions and following all the law, this law can save you, that's not going to happen. It won't save you. Now, but when James uses the same term and he talks about works or deeds, he's talking about living like Jesus because you are already a believer. So what is real faith? Well, James tells us four things that real faith is not. Let's, let's look at this first. And then he gives us two examples of what real faith really is like. I like this because first he gives us what it's not and what it's supposed to look like. And then he gives us a living example. Now, as we go through this today, you might use this point as what Paul said, 
examine yourself whether you are in the faith. Do I have this saving faith? Do I have real faith in my life? Do I practice real faith? Because Paul is saying, hey, he's talking to a believer, say, hey, examine yourself and test yourself. So as we go through this today, I think it would be a great idea to really examine ourselves. And I know when we talk about something like this, there's a tendency to look at someone, well, he's not believing this, he's not walking the walk. But I think for us today, as what Paul said, let's look inwardly. Now, first in James 2.14, 2.14 says this. It says, dear brothers and sister, sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you do not prove it by your action? That kind of faith cannot save anybody. Now, I'd like for you to take note, if you're, you're, you're reading that passage, what is the use of saying you have faith? James is saying, what is the use of saying you have faith if you don't have any action in your life? Now, here's the first thing he says real faith is. Not. Real faith, he's saying, is more than just saying words. Real faith is more than just the words I say. It's more than the confession I make with my mouth and with my words. Repeating something that I heard other people say doesn't mean that I have real faith. Claiming, claiming that I have real faith doesn't prove that I have real faith. Knowing all the religious words and all the religious phrases. Just because you say you have faith doesn't guarantee you've got it. That's what James is saying. And that's what Paul is telling us. Now, I think we've all met people who sounded like believers. Ever met them? I mean, they know all the right phrases. They know all the Christian phrases. They know all the traditions. They know how to, <clears throat> how to behave around church, right? But Paul said, and James said, their lifestyle doesn't match their word. People are saying, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, but their lifestyle doesn't match their words. Now, studies have shown that in the United States, most people claim to be a Christian. But the vast majority of Americans say, I'm a Christian but they sure don't act like it. Isn't that right? Notice what the survey said. 90% of Americans say that cheating your spouse is morally wrong. And they know the Bible says it's wrong. God says it's wrong to, to, to cheat your wife, right? Your spouse. And yet, get this, 30% of those surveyed admitted to cheating on their spouse. Now, what happened there? They confess their believers, but their lifestyle definitely doesn't prove it. And this is what James is saying. This is not just about the words you say. It's about the lifestyle you live. Now, today we make a mistake, and we tend to label anybody who's a celebrity or anybody who's a sports star as a Christian. If they just sound like a Christian, I've made that mistake. They say something, oh, I just thank God for making me succeed. I am just so grateful. Or somebody says and says something like this, oh, I just want to thank the man upstairs. Have you ever thought who that man upstairs is? Who are they talking about? Now, that doesn't mean they're a Christian. And I made that grave mistake. I remember <clears throat> when we first came to the States, and, you know, I... I grew up in a Christian community. So the word Jesus Christ was always used in the context of either praising him or talking about him. And I remember one day I was walking in the mall and I was with Max and someone said, Jesus Christ. And I talked to Max saying, Max, they're Christians. And Max turned to me and said, Phoebe, no, they're not. They're actually using the name of Jesus in vain. I didn't know that. Now, James is saying, just because you say you have faith, or just because you're mentioning all these Christian words, or all this religious uh, jargon, doesn't mean you've got real faith. Real faith is more than words. Now, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Jesus is speaking here. He said this, read that with me. He says, not everyone who says that I am their Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, think about that. Not everyone who says that I am their Lord, Jesus is talking here, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he said, the only people, Jesus, this is Jesus talking, the only people who will enter are those who do what my Father in heaven wants me to do. Think about that. 
It's not just what you say, it's what you do. Have you ever, you know, I, I think we're all guilty of this, right? We carry stickers in our car, we, you know, we, we wear a Christian t-shirt, and then something comes out of our mouth in our actions, our attitude, and I was thinking, wow, wow. Do I have real faith when I do that? Now, what value is phony faith? What value is fake faith? None. James is saying it is worthless. Talk is cheap. So real faith is more than just words. Here's the second thing he tells us, James tells us. <clears throat> real faith is more than just an emotion I feel. He says that in the, very, in the very next verse, he says, real faith is more than just an emotion I feel. You can be inspired, you can be emotionally moved, you can get a quiver in your liver, you can have goosebumps, and you can be really emotional and never have real faith. As a matter of fact, I, I was attending a conference, I, I was still in youth ministry back then, and I heard a pastor say, you know what, many times we are moved, but we are not changed. And he said, I'm tired of being moved. I want to be change, changed. James gives us an example of this. In James chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, he says this. Notice what he said. Suppose you see your brother or your sister, and they need food or clothing, and you say to them, oh, I wish you well. I hope you stay warm. I hope you eat well. And then he put, puts this challenge. But then you do not do, you don't, you, but then you do nothing to meet their needs. What good does your sympathy do? It is worth nothing. Now, in the same way James is still talking, he said this, if it is not accompanied by action, it doesn't work. It is dead. The faith is dead and useless. Now, can you imagine, do you see the sarcasm that James is using is? By the way, the book of James is the book of wisdom in the New Testament, just like Proverbs is in the Old Testament. He says, he uses sarcasm here. He says, you go up to somebody who's out of work and you say to them, hey, buddy, I, I, I feel you, I feel you. Hang in there, cheer up, keep your chin up. Don't worry, be happy, you'll be fine. James is saying, that's all talk. So you can say all those words, but it's not faith until you actually do something about it. You might feel for them. Now, if I fell in a ditch and I cannot get up, again, I cannot get out, I don't need your sympathy. I need your assistance. I need you to help me out of the ditch, right? I don't need you to say to me, oh, I understand, Phoebe, I sense your pain. I know how hard it is to be there, but you will be fine. No. James is saying, when you have real faith, you go out there and help them. You might feel sorry for them. You might feel sad about them. But if you do not act on that, you fail. Your faith is dead. Now, real faith, friends, is practical. It gets involved in people's needs. Faith is more than words, I say, and faith is more than the emotions I feel. I was tying this to our session, the, the, the campaign that we finished last, last, last month. And the last session we talked about was completely surrendering to God. And I was having this conversation with Max on our way here. I said, surely, surely Max, we cannot help everybody who's in need. We cannot really just feed everyone who's hungry. And I said, but James tells us that when we see someone in need, we are to respond. And then I thought about this. I said, you know, God speaks to us. And there are times when God, Jesus, when he was here, did not feed the, did not feed the whole world. But there were occasions where he helped people that, ha that he has encountered. Now, I know when we hear teachings like this, we feel a little bit guilty and like, so what am I going to do? Do I stop my job and feed all the hungry and go out there and take care of everyone who's in need? I don't think that's what it means. If we tie what we talk about today to what we learned last Sunday, it means doing what God tells us to do at the moment, surrendering and saying, God, if God tells you, I want you to do this, why don't you help that person? Why don't you buy lunch for that person? I'm not buying lunch for everybody, but here's the point. I kind of picked up from last our last Sunday session. 
When I completely surrender to God, God speaks to me. And when he speaks in my heart and say, Phoebe, I want you to go out there and, and do this for that person. Or I want you to pray for that person. I want you to give this to that person. When I listen to God at those moments, I don't have to give everything to everybody. But there are moments in our life where God speaks to us. Now, I'd like to say this. Jesus said this, my sheep know my voice. You know when God prompts you, when God speaks in your heart and says, I want you to go out there to that person and just do this. And I know, I believe that when we do that, we are practicing real faith. As James said, real faith is more than words and real faith is more than the emotions I feel. Here's the third thing that, Paul, that James t tells us. James says real faith is more than an idea I debate. And then he says that in the very next verse in chapter 2 in James, for some people, faith is just an intellectual game. It's just a mental challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a study in theology. It's a doctrine to be debated, and it's a dogma to be defended. It's an idea to be discussed. It's a truth that to be talked about and to be conversed. And sometimes this happens within Christian circles. It happens sometimes with us who are pastors. It happens with students. It happens with people who are taking apologetics, people who are knowledgeable at scripture. We could sit for hours and hours and discuss this matter and really forget listening to what God wants us and who God wants us to help. Now, in other words, for them, faith is not something you do. Faith is something that you discuss, something that you talk about, something that you debate about. They'll talk all day and night about God, about faith, and they'll be happy to debate you. And it's all about conversation, and it's not about conduct. They would rather discuss the Bible than do it. They would rather explain the Bible rather than live it. They'd rather debate theology than do it and practice it. Now, James said this. He imagines, he imagines an intellectual objector in this, third, in this third kind of fake faith. And here's what he says. Now, notice what James says. Now, someone may argue... <clears throat> Isn't it possible that some people have good faith while other people do good deeds? James say, but I say no. No, I cannot see your real faith if you don't do anything, if you don't do any real deeds to show me. He says, in contrast, I can show you my faith by the good things I do. In other words, he's saying, the guy goes, you're into doing good things, well, I'm into discussing good things. I like to discuss the Bible. I like to talk about the Bible. I really don't want to practice it. I don't want to talk about the application part. Let's just talk about the historical facts. Let's talk about all the things that it means. But I, you know, let's not go to the application. I remember attending a, a conference and one of the teachers and the speaker said this. A, an exegesis, a Bible teaching that has no application is useless. You have just aborted the text if you do that, if there's no application. And James is saying, hey, the key phrase here is verse 18. And if you're taking notes, I want you to circle this phrase. James says, show me, show me. He says, how do I know you've got the real faith? You show me. He says, real faith is visible. It is apparent. You can see it. You can show me. And the truth of the matter is we live in this time where people are saying, well, my faith is, is private. I keep it to myself. I don't really discuss my faith. And James said, hey, you cannot do that. Real faith is visible. You can see it and you can show it. So how do you know? somebody has really faith, has real faith. James says this, look at their lifestyle. Look at the way they speak. Look at the way they live their life. Look at the choices that they make. Look at how they love others. Look at, look at how they treat people. He, James is saying, look at his lifestyle. Look at her lifestyle. See, real faith, you cannot see it by itself. But real faith is expressed in visible ways. 
Now James is saying, mm, I'm, I'm the show me man. I want to show my faith. Because faith without action is useless. Show me your faith, and then I'll know it's real. He says, if you claim to be a Christian, James says, then I have the right to ask you to prove it to me by the way you live your life and by the way you prove it by your action. Now, the truth is really this. Somebody as big as God, listen to this, somebody as big as God cannot possibly come into your life without changing you visibly. I'm not talking the physical, but visibly. It's impossible for somebody as big as God and as powerful as God to come into your life and not change you inside out. The moment God changed you from the inside, the outside will always reflect the change that God does in your heart. And Paul reminds the Christian, the believers in Corinthians, he says this, hey, remember this, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Asian. He's a new creature. The old has passed away and the new has come. Every time, everything becomes new. Now, it doesn't become new in your life overnight. And that's the process. We've been learning this. It's not a process. But get this. Eventually, you're going to see the changes happening in your life. It doesn't come overnight. It doesn't happen over time. You know, when God comes into your life, he changes you from moment to moment. And I'll say this, I'll say this. You know that God comes, get, has come into your life when you see the changes happening inside you. You know without a doubt. And that change becomes visible to the people, especially those closest to you. Now here's the question, and I want you to, to really think about this. Were you persecuted, if you were persecuted right now in America for your faith, and I know we're not, we're not being persecuted like what our brothers and sisters in third world countries and other, other, Christ, uh, other difficult countries are. If, if you were put in trial and you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence to say, yes, he is the real thing. He is the real Christian. See, real faith always, listen to me, it always produces a changed life. One of the things that <clears throat> I always remind us Christians is this. When you claim to be a Christian, people do not listen to what you say. They look at how you live your life because they know. They know. For some reason, we know that people who are connected to God, people who are supposed to be connected to God, people who are supposed to be believers in Jesus Christ, actually lived a changed life. And the truth of the matter is, like what Paul said, we need to ask ourselves this question, am I changed? Because the real witness and the real evidence of you being in Christ is a life that is changed from the inside out. Now here's the fourth thing that, that James says, real faith is not. F real faith is more than just a truth, I believe. Now it seems like James is, is really covering all those, those, those areas. It's not just the words, it's not just my emotions. Now he's saying, it's not just something that I think. <clears throat> and then he said, it's not just something I debate. And then now he says, it's not just something that I believe. James again uses a little bit of sarcasm to make his point in James 2, 19 and 20. He says this, now you say, well, I believe there is a God. And I say, good for you. But even the demons believe, even the demons believe that and they're afraid. They tremble and they shudder. And then he said this, it is foolish not to realize that faith in God is useless if you don't do anything and don't do what he wants you to do. In other words, <clears throat> the guy comes and say to James, well, I believe in God, James. And James responded and said, big deal. Even the devil believes in God. 
and you're not going to find him in heaven, right? And the demons believe in God. As a matter of fact, he says there, they shudder, they tremble in their belief in God. And, 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 and why is that? Why did James point it out? Because it's one thing to have head knowledge about God, believe in God, and it is another thing to obey God, to love God, to trust God, and serve God. Friends, this is real. And we live in a time where a lot of people are confessing things. People are declaring, hey, I'm a man of faith. Hey, I'm a, I'm, 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 I'm a believer. I follow Jesus Christ. And one of the things I learned early on in my dad is this. He said, Phoebe, no matter who says they are Christians or they're follower of Jesus Christ, look at the way they live. Look at their lifestyle. Now you're saying, well, I'm not perfect. Of course, I make, I make mistakes. Absolutely, we all make mistakes. But James is saying here, a real believer is one who obeys, who loves and trusts and serve God. Look at their action. So what is real faith? It's not what I say. It's not what I feel. It's not what I believe. It's not, it's not all these things that I want to argue about and I want to debate about. James is saying, faith is something I do. Faith is something I do. Faith, in other words, is not passive, it is active. Faith is actually a commitment. It is a choice that I make. It is the action that I live by. Faith is the action that I do every single day of my life. James chapter 2, verse 26, he says this, just as the body without spirit doesn't breathe and is dead, so faith that doesn't do anything is dead. Can you imagine this? Look, look, look how practical James puts it. He uses analogies. He uses picture to tell us, hey, just as the body without a spirit doesn't breathe and is dead. So faith that doesn't do anything is just as dead. Have you noticed the word that James uses over and over in this section? There's a word that James uses over and over. He used it in every single verse that we read today. It is the word do. Now let me read a few of, of these verses again. He says this, if you do nothing, what good does your sympathy do? He says, what if you fail to do any real good deeds? And then he says, I'll show you my faith by what I do. He's saying faith in God, friends, is useless if you don't do what he wants you to do. Real faith in God is obeying, it's complying and saying, God, this doesn't make sense. God, I don't feel like doing this. This is uncomfortable. But God says real faith in God is useless if you do not do what God wants you to do. And he says faith doesn't do any, that doesn't do anything is dead. <clears throat> In other words, this is his point. He says it over and over. He's saying, get the message here, friends. Get the message here, folks. Faith shows up in my life, in my lifestyle. And if there is no change in my life, if I, if I don't see any change in my life, if I am living the same way as I am, before as I confess this whole thing, no matter what I pray, no matter who I followed, no matter what I did at that day, if my life hasn't changed, James is saying that faith is dead. It's not alive yet. Now in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, it says this, and this is a good verse to remember. He said this, stand firm in your faith, stay brave, be strong and notice what is said here. Do everything in love. I cannot think of a better sentence for you to remember. Stand firm, be strong, do everything in love. Stand firm in faith. Now James ends his little speech and his little essays be between the difference between what real faith is and not so real faith or fake faith by giving us two actual examples of living faith. And these two people were real people, 
but they were very, very different. They were named Abraham and Rahab. Now, these are the two people James chooses out of the Old Testament to demonstrate to his readers and to his listeners what real faith is. Now, Abraham had faith and, and Rahab had faith. Abraham was a man. Rahab was a woman. Abraham was a rich businessman. Rahab was a poor prostitute. She, wa- she works at the Red District in the city of Jericho. Their lives were many years apart. Abraham's story is in the book of Genesis. One day God came, comes to Abraham, who, who, was, who was not God-fearing. He was actually a pagan. He's, he's an idol worshiper in Ur of the Chaldees. And God comes to him and says, Abraham... <clears throat> I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your country. And and I'm going to ask you to follow me to a new location. And I want you to move all your families, all your servants, all your flocks, and your herds. And if you will trust me on this, I'm going to make you a great nation. Out of you will come and demonstrate what real faith is. And you know what? When you study the life of Abraham, he actually did. He became the father of faith and become the father of the Jewish nation. Just simply because God told him, go Abraham, I want you to do this. Now get this, get this. Abraham, and we mentioned this in the session last week. Abraham followed God without knowing where he was going. That's faith. He didn't say, okay, God, would you show me where we're going first? No, God told him, Abraham, just head out that direction. And Abraham asked God, how will I know when I get there, God? God says, I'll tell you when. Wow, that, my friend, is real faith. James is saying, that's real faith. He's going to a place he's never seen before. He's never been before. Trusting a God he didn't know before this time. But he acted on his faith. He held nothing back from God. He trusted God would provide. And later, guess what? If you follow the story, please read this. This is an awesome story of faith. And later he was tested again when God asked him to sacrifice his son on the altar. It was a test and Abraham knew it. He said this, if I sacrifice him, this is what Abraham knew. He said, if I sacrifice him, God could raise him back to life. I'm going to trust God. Now his whole life, he was trusting God, going ahead, stepping out in faith, taking a risk here and there without knowing where he was going. Now, James concludes his example of Abraham in verse 22. In your outline, he says this, Isn't it obvious, he's talking about Abraham, that faith and works are yoked partners, that faith expresses itself through works, and the works are works of faith. Wow, right? I love that in the message version where it says works are the works of faith. And in verse 23, get this, James wrote, God accepted Abraham's faith because he acted on it. Underline that if you have your word. Because he acted on it. And that faith that he acted on made him right with God. So Abraham was called the friend of God. Now I cannot think of a better thing to be called at the end of my life. Wow. Wouldn't it be nice to be put in your tombstone? She is a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I would like to be called a friend of God. And I know at the end of your life, I would like you to be called the friend of God. And that's because that's going to matter for eternity. Then James gives us the other story of Rahab. Now, that story is actually in Joshua chapter 2. I really encourage you to read that. I don't have time to read, to, to give you the details, but it's a great story. It's actually a spy story. Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt after 400 years of bondage. And they are getting ready to get into the new territory that God says, I'm going to give this promised land to you. 
Jericho was a highly fortified city and the people of that city were so scared of the Jews that were coming in and they were because they know they were going to have to fight them. Now there was a woman named Rahab. She was a prostitute. She was a street walker. And you know what she did, right? She risked her life to save the spies that Joshua sent into Jericho. Now get this, her action saved lives and revealed her heart of faith. And because she risked her life in order to save God's people, God put her in the genealogy of Jesus. Rahab's name appeared in the New Testament three times, one in the book of Matthew, in the book of Hebrews, and actually the Hall of Fame, uh, the, 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 hall, the, the, the Faith, a Hall of Fame in the Bible, and the book of James. Now do you know that in Matthew, in the New Testament, it lists all the people that belongs in the genealogy of Jesus. There are four women that are mentioned, and one of them is Rahab. She wasn't even a Jewish, and she was a prostitute, but her faith expressed in her action was more important than her background. And God said, I'm going to use this woman to be part of the lineage of my child, of my son. Now Rahab risked her, her life to save others. What she's doing, what was she doing here? She was showing faith in action. Our faith is demonstrated by what we do on a daily basis. It's one thing to claim you believe it, but it is a whole different thing to live it. Our behavior shows that what we really believe, unless we act on it, we don't really believe it. Now, I want you to take this message, and I encourage you to think about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, when he said this, examine yourself, to see whether you are really in the faith and test yourself. Now, I remember the other last Sunday when we were talking about complete surrender, that really hit me. And I'm thinking, God, I, I really want to be completely surrendered to you. But there are times, like what we said, there are times when God says, I want you to do this. And we take a step back or we delay or we say, God, next time, can I do that? Now, let me be clear. And I'll, I'll say this, James is telling us here, hey, talk is cheap. You can talk and talk and talk, but unless you move into action, and I'll say this, listen to what God's telling you. We learned this last week. What is God prompting you today? today? Maybe, I don't know what God's telling you, maybe just to read the Bible, maybe just to go out there and just enjoy nature and worship Him through nature. And the truth of the matter is we all could do that. We can all live out our faith. And James is saying, you need to take time to really think about whether you are in the faith or not, or whether what you're following is real faith. Now, let me be clear though. Works are not going to save you. They don't save you. That is very clearly spoken by Paul. You cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot earn your way to God. They are not the root of your salvation. Your actions, your character, your behavior, your good works, they are the fruit of what God has done in your life. That's the fruit of salvation. They show that you're a Christian. They do not make you all these good works that we're supposed to be doing doesn't make you a Christian, but they show that you are a Christian and you are a follower of Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul reminds us, read that with me. It says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith for a life of good work, which God has already prepared for us to do. Now, I want you to notice three prepositions in that sentence. First, it says, we are saved by grace. And then he said, we are saved through faith. And then the third one, it says, we are saved for a life of good works. Think about that. Do not mess up. Do not mess up the order to that. You got all three parts in your life. If you are saved by grace and you are saved through faith, it's going to show up in your life. You cannot have God, friends, come into your life and not change you. A few months ago, 
I think it was probably February, we had one of our guys in the church who had come out, and I love, I love the transparency he shared with us. Talk about his God story. He said, you know, I'm amongst you, I attend life group, <clears throat> I attend church with my family every Sunday. He goes, I have the form, I, I, I do everything, I act like everybody, but there was one thing I know, I was in change inside. And I was like, wow, how transparent is that? He said, I knew I, there's nothing changed in my life. I acted everything Christian from the outside. You, you know, some of you could be full that I was a Christian, but I knew deep inside me, I was not changed. Now, the order is important. What Paul is here saying, by grace through faith, you are saved. It is not of your works. It is, you were saved by grace, saved through faith. And I love what this guy said. When I finally got saved, I knew I was saved because the first thing I noticed in my life was the chains that happened within me. Now, God has a plan for your life that your life would make a difference. Now, the order is important here. By grace, through faith, for a lifetime, notice that, for a lifetime of good works. Now, I wanna close with just a couple of questions in light of what James has taught us today. Here's the first question you need to ask yourself. Am I really living the life that God wants me to live? Am I really in the faith? That's the first thing that Paul said. Test yourself, examine yourself. If you're really in the faith and test yourself, examine. <clears throat> Have you really put your faith in Christ? How do you know? How do you know that? I just said a few words. Has something changed inside you? Did, did it change your life? What changes can you really point out in your life? What changes can you point out? Is, the, is my lifestyle any different from where I was before? Am I a new creature? You see, each week we do a couple of things at the end of the service, at the end of the session. First thing we do is we reflect on what we heard. And then we recommit our life to Jesus Christ. And can I say this? If you have never done this, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. And I know many of us grew up religious. Many of us grew up probably going, growing up in Sunday school. I met someone just last Sunday. Yeah, man, Pastor Phoebe, this whole thing about following Jesus. <clears throat> you know, I grew up in Sunday school, but I do not remember really surrendering completely to God. And I know that's not new to me. Many people like that are like that. And I'd like to say this, James is telling us, hey, and Paul is telling us, there's two men of God is saying, you gotta check yourself, check it out. Are you there? Now I'd like to say this, maybe some of you are thinking, man, I don't know, Pastor Phoebe, I don't see real change in my life, I know. We all have those awakening, and that's why we need moments like this where God can say, hey, you're, you're, you have the form, but you do not have the power. You have, you have the behavior, you have the act, and you're confessing it, but you're not really living it. Now, would you bow your heads with me? And I just ask you to reflect for a few seconds. And maybe you're here and said, man, I didn't realize this. Don't worry, we all start somewhere. Some people do not know this. Some people thought that just because they come to church and they confess, and they say, and they do this, you know, they can live whatever they, how, however they want to live. And James said, no, you got to do what the Father wants you to do. Jesus says this, it is those who do what my Father commands are those who are going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. So this morning as you reflect, would you pray this prayer quietly? And this is just to get you started. This is, this is not the key prayer, okay? This is just to help those who probably don't know what to say. But if you do, <clears throat> please do pray on your own and say something like this. God, I don't want to have a fake faith. I want to really trust you, God. I want you to change my life for the good. 
God, maybe some of you will be honest and say, God, I thought I had it. I, I'm singing, I'm worshiping, I, I have all the lingo, God. But seriously, I'm no different than anyone who doesn't believe in you. God, I want you to change my life for good. And I don't want to just talk the talk, but I want to walk the walk. I want my life, God, to be like you, Jesus. I want my life to be different. I want my life to be what you made me to be. I want, I want to know your purpose for my life. And God, I am asking you to change me. I am giving you permission, God. I'm making my choice this morning for you to change me from the inside out. I want to learn to trust you and follow you like Abraham and like Rahab. Jesus Christ, I give you my life completely today. In your name I pray. Amen. I hope this has helped you in your spiritual journey again. And, and, and I'd like to say this, maybe this can also be this can also be like a standard when you look at other people and say, hey, I'm a Christian. For you women, when you meet guys, they say, hey, I'm a Christian too. I don't believe what they say. Look at their life. Or men, if women come to you and say, hey, you know, I'm a Christian too. I believe in Jesus Christ. James and Paul said, look at their lifestyle. Look at their action. Look at the choices that are made. Not just the word they say. May God bless you. And I am so excited to start the next series next, next Sunday. So I'll see you there. May God bless you. Have a great week. And hey, live the life that God has given you. I love you all. God bless. Higher, burning me your desire.